Okay, if we could have everyone take their seat. So I've got Carrie up here. Both of us are gonna introduce Rick and Denise Renner. I'm not very good at introductions. My, I just say that Rick loves God and he's awesome. And that's about all I have to say. Uh, Carrie can say a lot more. But let me say that Rick and Denise, I meant them. Man, I don't even remember, but it was close, but a little less than 40 years ago. And you know, this is how, I hate to admit this, but Rick asked me if I had any suggestions for him. And I said, don't use Greek as much. And man, that's what he's built this ministry off of. And every time I hear him going into the Greek and the Hebrew, I think, boy, that was a dumb thing to say. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, he is just a pastor's pastor. He will dissect every word and tell you what it means. And he pastors over in Russia. Rick and Denise have been in Russia for how long now? 31 years. 31 years. Man, that's awesome. And anyway, uh, Mike and Carrie got to know them, of course, with the Russia connection and things. And so I'll let her give the rest of the story. <laughs> no, guys, I just want to say for Rick and Denise and their whole family, uh, they are such a blessing. You know, it was actually interesting. We were in Russia for 16 years and never met them. Every time we come back, they'll say, do you know Rick and De It's a big country, granted. So, but they would always say, do you know Rick and Denise? And we're like, no, we don't. It just, we never had a connection. We tried one time and we missed each other. And when we came back to America, we first met Joel. So Joel is one of their sons. And we just had, it was like a Ruski brat, a Russian brother. And we just really hit it off. And then we met uh, uh, Rick and Denise. And they become really great friends. But guys, I'll tell you what is so powerful, what uh, Rick and Denise have done within Russia, not only within Moscow, but just so many disciples and so many things across Russia and hundreds and hundreds of church plants. And, and our Karis Live Bible studies actually came as an idea from what they were doing in their church and reaching out from their church to all of the villages that don't have any churches or any pastors. They're truly reaching Russia with the gospel. And so I just really honor them for the seed that they have sown and that has a harvest that's going to last a lot longer. Your son, um, Paul, uh, so he's now the pastor of Good News Church there in Moscow. It was interesting. Paul was here for uh, one of the conferences, and he happened to get together with a number of Ukrainian Russians that we have here in the Bible school and in the ministry. And so we have a small home church here within Woodland Park that's made of Russians and Ukrainians. And so he was there, and every single one of them had a connection to Good News Church. Every single one of them's lives had been changed through your ministry, and now they're here helping us minister the gospel. And so we want to say thank you for all that you have sown. So you guys are going to be tremendously blessed blessed by him today. So, And let me just add this last thing, that they break the mold of a typical missionary, which is good to break that mold. They aren't poor. They went over there and they started and paid for a church, built a church and did all of this, raised the money and prosperous. They've just taken over, is it CTN Network? CNL Network. And they took that over and now run a uh, television network. And man, God is blessing them and you're going to be blessed. And you also need to pray about being a part of this. We'll take up an offering during the second hour, but you need to sow into this ministry. It's a great ministry. So let's welcome Rick Renner as he comes to minister to Good morning. So good to be here. I, you know, really, we've known Andrew and Jamie about 40 years. The first time I came to see Andrew, they had a little building in Manitou Springs. And you were just writing your Bible commentary back in those days. And when we come here, it is so amazing. Is this amazing what God has done in this place? But I want to introduce my wife. This is Denise. Denise, would you stand? Next to her is Joel Renner, who's the CEO of our ministry. 
But we're just so glad to be here and privileged that I can speak to you twice today. And I want to see if you have your Bibles. Hold your Bible up in the air. Amen. Always bring your Bible when you come to Bible school. And today I want you to open your Bible to Matthew chapter 24. I have two sessions. So today I'm going to do two really different things. And today we're going to begin by talking about the last days. So open your Bible to Matthew chapter 24. But we brought one book and you cannot buy it because we brought it to give to you. So we have about a thousand of them and it's called Dream Thieves, Overcoming Obstacles to Fulfill Your Dreams. You will never forget, Andrew, when I wrote this book, we received a call from Gloria Copeland and she said, hey, I want to buy that book for some of my friends. And our office said, well, how many do you need? She said, 10,000. I said, well, that's a lot of friends. But this book has gone around the world and it will really encourage you to stand by the word that God has given you. Amen? And that's what I'm going to talk about in the second session. But let's open our Bible to Matthew chapter 24, and we're going to begin in verse 3. And Father, we thank you for today. And Holy Spirit, we look to you. You're the great teacher. You authored this word. You're really the only one that knows how to teach it. And so today we ask you to open the scriptures to us. Not that we would just hear it, but we ask you to take us into the scriptures until we feel them, we experience them, and we're changed by them. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Can I just tell one more testimony? You know, we haven't been here since before COVID, but when COVID struck, Russia really locked down. And so Denise and I said to certain members of our media team, well, we have an opportunity, and if we will go online and stay online, we will capture a significant audience because the rest of the Russian world was not online. We were the only ones online. Well, when COVID began, we had 30,000 members of our online church. We went online with seven live webcasts a day. That's a lot of television for live TV. When COVID ended, we had 200,000 members of our online church. Is that amazing? You know, you have to decide what you're gonna get. 10 spies, saw giants, two spies, saw fruit. Everybody got what they saw. And we chose to see fruit rather than to see COVID. And we walked out of that with a greater impact in our online church than we've ever had. So I just wanted to share that. But open your Bible to Matthew chapter 24. We're going to begin in verse three. And verse three says, as he, that's Jesus, sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming, and of the end of the world? Well, you have to understand the setting in which this took place. They were sitting on the Mount of Olives, and from the Mount of Olives, they had a panoramic view of the Temple Mount, and they were looking over at the temple and seeing everything in the distance. It was quite a prophetic picture. And in that environment, they begin to ask Jesus private questions. And notice what they asked him. When shall these things be? If you have an ink pen or a pencil, underline or circle the word when. When shall these things be? What shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Either circle or underline the word what, then either circle or underline the word sign, and then either circle or underline the word end and the word world. All of these words are very important in this verse. And when you exegete these words, you really find out precisely what they were asking the Lord. First of all, they said when. The Greek word is pote. It means exactly when. Don't fudge with us. We want to know exactly when these things are going to happen. Second, they said what. The word what is the little Greek word T. It's just two letters, T-I. It describes the most minute, minuscule detail. It was the equivalent of saying, Lord, we want to know exactly, precisely what will be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world. The word sign is the Greek word simeon. And the word simeon was precisely the word used in the ancient world to describe road markers to tell you how far you had come on your journey and how much further you had to travel before you reached your destination. For example, Denise and I live outside the wonderful city of Moscow. And when we travel into Moscow, there are signs 
which tell us how far we've gone and how much further we have to go before we reach our destination. And as we travel, we see another sign and another sign and another sign. If there were no signs, we would not know where we were in the journey. But the signs tell us where we are. The signs tell us how much further we have to go. And that is the word which is used in this verse, which means they were really saying, Lord, what will be the signs that we will see on the prophetic road? The signs we will see on the prophetic road as we come to the end of the world. The word end is the Greek word suntileas. It's really the word for the wrap up. And a problem here is in this verse is the word world. The word world in Greek is the word Ionos, it is not the word cosmos, which would describe the universe. It is not the Greek word geis, which is the Greek word for the physical planet Earth. And the truth is the world is never going to end. It's going to be changed, but the world is never going to end. Then what did Jesus, what did the disciples mean? Well, this word world, the Greek word Ionos, really is the word for the age. How will we know that we are approaching the wrap up of the age? What will be the signs we will see to tell us that we're getting closer and closer and closer to that destination? And they asked for one sign. But when you come to Matthew chapter 24, we find that Jesus enumerated many, many signs that would be evident as we come closer to the end of the age. Interesting that when they got with Jesus alone, Jesus began to tell them things that he would not tell the crowds. And likewise, when you spend time with the Lord, he will say things to you privately that he'll never say to you when you're in the presence of others. And Jesus really enumerated a lot of signs that would be indicative that we're coming toward the close of the age. And the first sign he gave, most people miss completely. Most people jump right to verse 6. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled for all these things must come that the end is not yet. Then they continue in verse seven for nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes and divers prices. All of these are the beginning of sorrows. But they skip right over verse four because they do not understand the enormity of verse four. And in verse four, Jesus gave them the first and primary sign to alert us that we have sailed into the end of the age. And what does he say? And Jesus answering said unto them, take heed. In Greek, the word take heed is the Greek word blepo. It means look, listen. It is so strong. It's like he was trying to reach out to grab them by their collar and really shake them to get their attention. Listen to what I'm about to tell you. Take heed. Then he says, that no man deceive you. Everybody say deceive. And Jesus gave this as the first sign and the primary sign that would alert us that we've sailed into the last day's season. And this word deceive is the Greek word planeo. If you're taking notes and you're students, so you should, you would spell it P-L-A-N-A-O, the Greek word planeo. This word planeo is a very specific word which describes a moral wandering, a moral wandering. This is not just deception in general. I would call this delusion. And in fact, you find the same word in 2 Timothy, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, where Paul writes that God will send strong delusion among the people. It is the very same word. It's delusional thinking where people begin to believe what even is contrary to medicine or to scientific facts. And in fact, this word was used very popularly by rabbinic writers between the time of the Old and the New Testament. You know, some people say that God was silent during that period, but God has never been silent. He's always been speaking for anyone who has ears to hear. And during the two Testaments, there were what was called intertestamental prophets, and they primarily prophesied about the end of the age, and they prophesied, and Jesus would have been reared on those prophecies, that you will know it is the end of the age because spirits of delusion will be released into society at the very end of the age, and that will be the primary marker that you've come to the very end of the age. Well, Jesus was familiar with those intertestamental teachings. And now Jesus confirms. 
He says, take heed, blepo, listen to me, listen to me, trying to jar them to get their attention. Here is the first sign, the primary sign that will really wake you up. See that no man deceive you. But this word planel, this word deceive, even described an animal that got so far off track that it could never find its way back home. And the use of this word tells us at the end of the age, society as a whole will morally veer so far off track that eventually they'll never be able to come back to where they once were. And in fact, this word planea was also used to describe a person who has left a well-worn path that he has always walked upon. In this case, it would be a moral path of what is right and what is wrong. And now he has diverted from that path and he's walking along the edge of a cliff that is extremely dangerous. It's a preposis that he could fall from at any moment. But he has veered from a well-worn established path. That is the word which Jesus uses here. And of course, we're living in the age of delusion. Can anybody say amen to that? When men think they're women and women think they're men, it is absolutely crazy. It's contrary to science, contrary to medical fact, and yet people are embracing delusion. And Jesus said, when you see this, when you're living in delusionary times, you will know you've come to the end of the age. Now, today we're gonna be going several places in the Bible. Next, I want you to go to 2 Timothy chapter three. 2 Timothy chapter three. And you're gonna find out today why Charis is so important and why it's vital that you are here. 2 Timothy chapter three. And in 2 Timothy chapter three, the apostle Paul's writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and he points 2,000 years into the future and describes what the world will be like at the end of the age. And he begins in verse one by saying, this know also that in the last days, perilous times shall come. The word know in Greek is the word ginoskete. It's very direct. It's a form of the Greek word ginosko, which describes something that must be known, something that must be understood. This is not optional. So whatever the Holy Spirit is about to describe is something that we must know. This is not optional information. And I want you to understand that God is not in the business of scaring us, but he is in the business of preparing us. And here God is especially preparing a last day's generation to know what they will confront so that when they're living in the midst of it, they won't be taken by surprise. God's not scaring us. He's preparing us. And he says, this know also that, in Greek it's the word hote, it's very specific, especially know this. Here it is. That in the last days, perilous times shall come. We're going to unpack this verse. The word last is the Greek word eschatos. Do any of you hear another word? You hear the word eschatology, which is what? You're students, so tell me what is eschatology? It's the study of end times or last things. But what does the word eschatos really mean? The word eschatos describes the very, very, very end of a thing. For example, you could use this word last, the word eschatos, to describe the very last day of the week, the last day. Or you could use the word eschatos to describe the very last day of the month, or you could use this word eschatos to describe the very last month of the year. It always describes what is final, what is the very end. And in fact, this word eschatos was used in the first century when Paul was writing to describe the farthest ends of the earth, and it was used as a navigational term, importantly, to describe the last port for a ship. So if you sail to this port, it is the last port. You can go no further. You've come to the end of your journey. And that is the word which was used here, which means you would literally translate the verse. Here is something you must know emphatically. You must understand that when time has sailed to the last port and no time remains anymore for the journey. So the Holy Spirit's pointing to the very end. Some people call this the end of days. 
And in fact, that would be a very good translation. So Paul's pointing 2,000 years into the future, describing what's going to happen at the very end of the age. And he says, when time has sailed to the last port, perilous times shall come. And the word perilous is the Greek word kalopos. It's only used two times in the New Testament. You spell it C-H-A-L-E-P-O-S, kalopos. Here it's translated as the word perilous. But the word kalopos, which here is translated perilous, describes something so full of danger that if you get near it, it is likely that you could be hurt or you could be harmed. It represents a high risk, something that is extremely threatening. And in fact, you could even translate it threatening times, high risk periods of time, damaging, hurtful times will come. But to understand that word, You have to go to the other place where it's used in the New Testament. So hold your finger here. And if you would, turn over to Matthew chapter 28, the only other time this word is used in the New Testament. And when you come to Matthew chapter 28, Jesus has sailed across the Sea of Galilee. He's sailing to the country of the Gadarenes where he confronts two demon-possessed men. The demon-possessed men in the country of the Gadarenes. And when you come to Matthew chapter 8, verse 28... The Bible tells us. And when he was come to the other side, there met him two possessed with devils. By the way, when the Bible says possessed, that word possessed is a very bad translation. It's the Greek word which really describes people that are demonized. They're demonized. Maybe not fully possessed, but they are demonized. They're under the influence of demons. But these two particular men were exceeding fierce. Underline those two words. The word exceeding fierce is the same word kalopos, which is translated perilous in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. So you could translate, there were coming out of the tombs perilous men who were exceedingly fierce, the Greek word kalopos, which means these two demon-possessed men were so uncontrollable that people were afraid of them. If you got near to these two men, it is likely that you would have been hurt or you would have been damaged in some way. They posed a very high risk. And that's why the Bible says, so that no man might, what? Pass by that way. The word way is the Greek word hodas. It's the word for a road. And there was a road that went down that side of the Sea of Galilee. And if you were in the north and you wanted to take that side of the sea to the city of Jerusalem, you had to take that road. And these two demon-possessed men lived in the tombs, in the cliffs, just a little beyond that road. And when people would travel from the north, south, or from the south, north, and they would come to this particular juncture in their journey, these demon-possessed men would come charging out of the tombs, out of the cliffs, and they posed such a threat to those that were traveling that people were afraid to take the road. And that point became, listen to this, it became an impasse. It became an impasse that people did not know how to get around. Now keep that in mind and go back over to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. This know also that in the last days, when time has sailed to the last port and no time remains for the journey, perilous times, high risk periods will come, which will create a kind of an impasse. People at general will say, where are we? What are we confronting? Will we ever be able to get around this? And it's talking about developments which are taking place in society. And in fact, these developments are going to be so all encompassing that the verse goes on to say perilous times. What are the next two words in the King James version? Shall come. I'm even going to teach on the words shall come because in Greek, it is the word in plus the word stamy compounded together. This is really, really important because the word in means to be inside something. The word stamy means to stand and it describes people at the end of the age who will feel like they are surrounded standing in the middle of nonsense on every side. It doesn't matter where they look, if they look this direction or turn this direction or look behind them or before them, they are completely standing in the midst of perilous times, nonsense, delusion on every side. 
And that is the age which we're living in today. We are living in delusionary times. And Jesus said, when you see this, this is the first and foremost sign to alert you that you've sailed to the end of the age. And then when you continue in 2 Timothy chapter 3, which we will not, Paul begins to give us all the signs that will really be indicative. Everything we will feel surrounded by at the very end of the age. Now, I want you to go to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. And when we come to Romans chapter 1, we find one of the most brilliant texts in the New Testament. The entire New Testament is brilliant, but this particular text is simply genius. And when you come to Romans chapter 1, you find what the world will be at the end of the age. And in Romans chapter 1, verse 18, Paul begins to describe mankind when mankind has finally reached the end, the fullness of man without God. And he says in verse 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Circle the word hold. The word hold is the Greek word kateko. It's a compound of two words. The word kate describes something that is coming down. It's dominating. It is subjugating. The second part of the word is echo, which means to have, to hold, or to embrace. But when you compound the two words together, it is someone who wraps their arms around something. They're not ignorant of it. They have it. They know it. They've read it. They've been exposed to it. But because they don't like what they've been exposed to, they hold it down. They suppress it. And here we find at the end of the age... Society as a whole will say, put a lid on that. Don't let that truth get out. Stop that story. Stop that truth. Society will try to silence the church. It's not that they're ignorant of it. They are very well aware of it. They just try to put a lid on it so that it won't get out where it will affect the thinking of people. And then in verse 19, because... That which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath shown it to them. Which means every person has the witness of God in his own heart. But then look at verse 20. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things which are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So verse 20 says, even nature itself witnesses to God. Then verse 21. Because that, when they knew God... They glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. But notice at the first of verse 21, because that when they knew God, this word knew, the Greek word ginosko, which here describes a general kind of knowledge, or Paul says there was a time when society at large at least had a respect for the things of God. They may not have all been born again, but they had a general respect. They were a God-fearing society, and they even, but then they came to a moment when they glorified him not as God, which means it no longer became popular to talk about God or to focus on God. And in fact, the verse says, neither were thankful. And wow, this is powerful. Because in Greek, it is the word akaristos. The word karistos means to be thankful. If you put an A on the front, it describes a people who were once very, very thankful, but now that A has canceled that, it has reversed the condition. It's a people who were once God-fearing, thankful to God, but now they think that is no longer popular, that's no longer the way we're going to go. So God has kind of been put to the side, and even the recognition of God is no longer the thing to do. This is not a part of our progressive way of thinking. So God is put to the side, and notice what happens when people cease to glorify God and cease to be thankful. And by the way, when people cease to be thankful, they become entitled. And that also is in 2 Timothy chapter 3. Paul describes entitlement in that chapter. But he says they became vain in their imaginations. The word vain, the Greek word metaios, it describes something that is utterly wasted. The word imaginations is a form of the Greek word logismos. It's where you get the word for logical thinking. It describes the mind, the faculty of the mind, their logic. Their logic becomes ill-affected. They become wasted in their conclusions. And he says their foolish heart was darkened. Well, the word heart describes the human heart. It's the Greek word cardia. It's where you get the word for cardiac or cardiac arrest. It's the word cardia. So you have to stop for a moment and say, what does the heart do? 
the heart pumps. And what does the heart pump? Pumps blood. How much of your body has blood in it? Every part of your body has blood in it. In fact, that blood is being regularly circulated through your body because your heart is pumping and pumping and pumping and pumping and pumping. And now Paul says, the heart of society at the end of the age will no longer pump blood like the human heart would do, but the heart of society will begin to pump darkness and pump darkness and pump darkness and pump darkness until all of society will be touched by this delusionary darkness. Then he says in verse 23, all the while professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. The word professing would be better translated alleging themselves to be. It doesn't mean that they are. It's just how they're projecting themselves. They're declaring that they're the leaders of a new kind of liberal, progressive way of thinking. We're turning from the primitive way of thinking of the past. We're letting loose of that anchor, and we're going to forge forward into a new world. We're going to frame a new society, a progressive world, alleging themselves to be wise and the word wise here, the Greek word Sophia, which means they declare themselves to be the uppercut of society, just a little bit better than everybody else. We are the thinkers of a new world. But Paul says instead they became fools. The word fools is the Greek word moreno, and you can guess what word we get from that. It's where you get the word for morons. <laughs> now this is the Holy Spirit speaking through Paul, and Paul writes and says, they will allege that they are the thinkers of a new world, the uppercut, the brilliant thinkers of a new society, but in fact, their thinking has become so wasted that really, they become morons in their conclusions. That's a literal translation. Just listen to the news, you'll find a bunch of morons. Verse 23, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and to four-footed beasts and creeping things. And what you have in verse 23, again, is just brilliant. Verse 23 is Paul giving us a history of idolatry in reverse. That's what it is. And he's going to tell us where idolatry will end at the end of the age. Well, if you study the history of idolatry, and that's one of the things I do because I teach about the Greek and the Roman and the Egyptian world, the ancient world, idolatry began with what? Creeping things. They worshiped snakes. They worshiped beetles. They worshiped bugs. But as time went by, man's thoughts began to ascend a little higher. In addition to worshiping creeping things, they began to worship four-footed beasts, cows, cats, things that walked, bulls. And as time went by, in the history of idolatry, their mind began to ascend a little higher and they began to worship flying things, birds. And in fact, if you look at the insignia of the Roman Empire, the insignia of the Roman Empire was the eagle. This was the apex for them of idolatry, things that fly. It was symbolic of man ascending into the heavens. And so Paul in this verse says, hey, man began by worshiping creeping things. Then man moved up and began to worship four-footed beasts. Then he began to worship birds that fly, heavenly creatures. And then he says at the end of the age, they will worship man, corruptible man. Man will become his own idol. And when you worship yourself, and when you believe that you are God, then you also believe that you have the right to do and to change anything that you want to change. You throw away old beliefs and then you become the creator, the creator of a new world. So now look at verse 24. Wherefore, in light of this, God also gave them up. Well, people who are cynical read verse 24 and they say, well, look at this. God just gave up on us. But that's really not what the Greek says. A better translation would be, wherefore God released them. God released them. God is a respecter. God will let you worship anything that you want to worship. If you want to worship a cow, he'll let you worship a cow. If you want to worship man, 
God will release you to worship whatever you wish. And at the end of the age, society, society is going to be in worshiping man. This verse really means God therefore released them. And notice what the worship of man results in. He released them to uncleanness, to the lusts of their own hearts. The word uncleanness is a Greek word which always describes sexual uncleanness. And then it goes on to say, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. The word dishonor is a very specific Greek word which really means to misplace or displace bodies, to put bodies where bodies don't naturally fit, to put them where they don't naturally belong. And here he's describing sexual perversion. And as you continue, he says, who changed the truth of God into a lie. Again, it's not that they're ignorant of the truth. They just don't like the truth anymore. They're trying to put a lid on it, cap it, so it doesn't get out where it can affect people. And in fact, they change the truth of God. This word really means to exchange. It's almost like they had the truth of God on the table and they had their own plans on the table. And now they're so flawed in their thinking, they can't even determine what is better, God or man. And they exchange God. They move him out of the way and they choose their own lie instead. And what do they do? They worshiped and served the what? The creature worshiping themselves more than the creator who is blessed forever and ever. Amen. Verse 26. For this cause, God gave them up. A better translation is God just released them. If this is what you want, just go for it. I won't hold you back. God released them unto vile affections, which again has to do with sexual perversion for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was meat, which he will describe in the next verse. What was the recompense of their error, which was meat? Look at verse 28. And even as they did not like to retain God, it's not an ignorance of God. It is his decision to put him aside. They no longer wanted to hold on to God. They no longer wanted to retain him in their mind. Why? Because if you have God in your mind and the truth of God in your mind, then you cannot do what you're doing. You know that there is an accountability for the way you live, an accountability for what you endorse. And therefore, rather than live under the constant thought of accountability to God, they said, let's just get rid of him. I completely understand this because Denise and I have lived in the former Soviet Union for 31 years. Now, the czarist regime, which ruled before Lenin came to power, may not have been the best, but at least Russia as a whole was orthodox. There was a huge Pentecostal and Baptist movement that was taking place. Russia was really being touched by God. And then the communists came to power. And the communists were also what? Atheists. You know why they were atheists? Because if they really believed in God, they could not do what they were about to do. If they really knew God was going to deal with them for murdering the millions they were about to murder, then they couldn't do it with a clean conscience. So they just removed God. They said he no longer exists. And when you remove God from the picture, then suddenly you're in a position where you can do whatever you want to do because there are no eternal ramifications. And here we find they didn't like to retain God in their knowledge. So God gave them over to a what? A reprobate mind. And notice a reprobate mind is connected to doing, to do those things that are not convenient. Well, I told you that in verse 27, it says they received in themselves that recompense of their error, which was meat. That recompense of their error is in verse 28. It is a reprobate mind. It's a reprobate mind. Now, when I was growing up, we freely used the word reprobate to describe anybody we didn't like. <laughs> Even people in our church would say, ah, he's just a reprobate. Had no idea what we were saying. And most people to this day don't really know what the word reprobate means. But it's the Greek word adikimos, and you have to understand that the word dikimos describes that which is wonderful, 
that which is just splendid, something that is superior. But if you put a privative on the front, which is the little letter A, it becomes adikimos. And here it's used to describe an adikimos mind. It is a mind which was originally created by God to be genius, to be brilliant in every respect. But now it is no longer brilliant. Something has happened to the mind. It's become modified. And really the word reprobate describes a mind which by continual bombardment, bombardment, bombardment. Today we know from scientists that there is a plasticity to the mind. You can literally change the way that you think. And a reprobate mind is a mind that has been subjected to wrong thinking, wrong propaganda for so long that the mind literally begins to be reshaped, reformed. It no longer thinks correctly like it was corrected to think, but now it's a flawed mind that really believes the lie is the truth. And this is why we're told by Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 5 verse 20 that there will be a time when people call darkness light and they will call good bad. They will call all of these things by a reversal because their mind has been so bombarded and by constant bombardment, 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 bombardment over a long period of time, they begin to think differently and release what they once believed and begin to believe the nonsensical propaganda which is being given to them. This is why it is so dangerous for our children in public schools today. We're talking about the process of reprobate. Actually, we're living in the age of reprobate when society as a whole is going through mental modification. How many of you know that that's truth? That's why you need to be in this school. That's why you need to stick with the Bible. If you'll just stick with the Bible and believe the Bible, you're already leagues ahead of everybody else. But Paul says they will receive a reprobate mind, a modified mind, an ill-affected mind. You could even translate it a flawed mind. Denise and I were watching a politician on the news just speaking pure nonsense. Just nonsense. About transgender and how the Christian thing is to honor those who want to have an abortion. I was listening to this person. And as I listened to this individual, I realized this person really believed what they were saying. They really believed it. We were seeing a reprobate mind so modified that now they embrace the lie as the truth. And then he goes on in verse 29 and says what happens to society when it becomes reprobate. Here's a summation. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, verse 32, who knowing the judgment of God, this is not an ignorant people. This is a people who once had knowledge of God and about eternal ramifications, who knowing these things, even knowing that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do it. In other words, they engender this behavior. And Paul tells us this also will be what the world will be like at the end of the age. Now, up until now, we've been talking about the lost world or society. But now if you would go over to 1 Timothy chapter 4. And in 1 Timothy chapter 4, we find that the delusion that is in the world will attempt to find its way into the church. And in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1, it says, now the Spirit speaks expressly. That word expressly is the Greek word retas. It's where you get the word rhema. It describes something that is categorical, unmistakable, absolutely emphatic. Which means this is not something that may happen. The Holy Spirit is speaking in unmistakable terms. This is going to happen in the latter times. Notice what it says. Now the Spirit speaks emphatically, categorically, indisputably, unmistakably. 
That in the latter times, the word latter here is different, the Greek word husteros, which describes the very end of the thing when nothing is left over again, it paints the very end of the age. That in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. Praise God, it does not say everybody, but it does say some, and the Greek word some means a notable some, a notable some. And in fact, when you read 2 Peter chapter 2, Peter says, large numbers of people will begin to embrace false doctrine at the end of the age. It's the Greek word poloi. There is no mistaking. It describes massive numbers of people. And this is why Andrew Womack is important. That's why this school is important. That's why your ministry is important because we need to be the ones that are bringing teaching that people can trust. We need to bring the truth in a world that has really gone astray. And verse one continues to say, some shall depart from the faith. It does not say they will reject the faith. It doesn't say that. There's a difference between rejecting and departing. The word rejecting would be waking up one day and saying, I'm done with this. I don't believe in God anymore. I don't believe the Christian faith. I'm just going to walk away from that and reject it. It's intentional. But this says they shall depart, the Greek word aphistomy, from the word apo, which means away, it carries the idea of distance, the word staming, which means to stand, which describes an end time church, some in the end time church, who once had one scriptural position. But now something has happened. And they're beginning to embrace, according to this verse, seducing spirits, and doctrines of demons, and guess what the word seducing is? It's the same word deception which Jesus used in Matthew chapter 24, the word planeo. It means people will begin to believe moral things that are not right. They're just not right. But because they're hearing it all the time and their brains are being modified, even some people in the church will begin to consider other options and they will begin to depart from the Greek word ephistomy, which means to step away from and put distance between yourself and what you once believed. They'll begin to distance themselves from the faith. Notice it says the faith. This word, the faith, in Greek has a definite article. That definite article is important because it means this is not faith for miracles or faith for signs and wonders or faith for the supernatural. The definite article means they're going to begin distancing themselves from the clear authoritative teaching of the faith, which is doctrine, which is the teaching of the Bible. They'll begin to think that maybe this is just an old way of thinking. It's too narrow-minded, and something begins to lure them away from it. They think it's progressive thinking, just moving into a new world, not understanding it is the activity of seducing spirits that's luring them off that well-established track that we began talking about today. And it's luring them over onto a very dangerous edge of a cliff from which they could fall with the rest of society. And then it says doctrines of demons. The word doctrines is the Greek word didaskalia. The word didasko means I teach. Kalos describes something wonderful. You compound the two words together. Didaskalia describes well packaged information. Well packaged information. Which means at the end of the age, the devil's not going to show up with horns on his head and red skin and a pitchfork in his hand, but he's going to come forward with well-packaged information through the courts, through the public schools, through the universities, well-packaged information that will sound so reasonable that it will lure people away from their foundation. And this is why sending a young person to the university today may be the most dangerous place you can send a young person today. They are being bombarded. Their minds are being mentally modified by well-packaged information. And they're being taught that their church and their parents are the ones that are nonsensical. And the Bible says doctrines of demons, the word demons, the Greek word daimonion, which in the time of the New Testament describes spirits, listen to this, spirits that cause lunacy or madness. It's a mad kind of thinking. It's lunacy thinking. 
So now we know from the words of Jesus that deception will be rampant at the end of the age. Now we know from 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, it's going to be perilous times. We're going to feel that we're surrounded by it. Now we know from Romans chapter 1 that man at the end of the age will be released to himself, and that release will be bad. Now we know from Paul's words in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, that this will even attempt to affect those that are inside the church. So what are we supposed to do? That's what we're going to talk about in the next session. All righty, everyone, that is the bell, so let's go ahead and let's find our seats. Uh, today, we're going to take up this opportunity to take up an offering for Rick Renner. How many of you guys are enjoying the message today? <laughs> Amen. Phenomenal, phenomenal things happening. But this is what the scripture said in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 10 in the New Living Translation. It says, for God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread to eat. In the same way, he will provide and increase your resources and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. So guys, God is a faithful, faithful giver. Uh, ushers, we can go ahead and pass the envelopes. Thank you guys. But man, I want to encourage you guys today that God is good. He's given us a phenomenal word today and there's more to come. But God not only wants to give us a phenomenal word, but he wants to give us an opportunity to say, I'm going to receive that word. And one of the best ways that we can do that is not just by taking our notes or just saying amen to the message, but it's by what we give. Today, us giving today is saying, you know what, God, I am in agreement with what is being shared. I'm in agreement with the waking up of uh, not being deceived. And so as we give today, guys, we are saying today that we are going to stand with that. And then ultimately, guys, it is God who gives us that seed to give. So today, as uh, the envelopes are passing, I just want you to ask the Lord, Lord, what are we giving today? And understand that as we give or as we're, you know, um, putting our offering in today, we are sowing in good ground. Amen? Amen. I'm going to uh, go ahead and uh, open up in prayer for the offering. So Father God, we just give thanks and we just magnify you. Thank you, Lord, for giving us seed to receive and seed to give. Thank you, Lord, that you are more than enough. You give more than enough. So right now, we just say yes with this word. We say yes to the assignment. And we agree with what Rick is sharing with us today. So we praise you in Jesus' name. Everybody said. Amen. Amen. We can receive the offering. Andrew. Right, help, roll over. right before Rick comes up, let me just say that I've asked, I think they have around 2,500 people per week that are a part of their church. It's the Good News Church in Moscow. Like he said, they've got a huge uh, online presence and many people. And he said so many awesome things. I just wanted to focus on one that when he was making the point about being an atheist, that removes all responsibility and you become your own God. And that, that we see that happening in our nation. It's not to the degree that it was under the communist in Russia, but it's the exact same spirit. It's the same location. And man, it is so important that you receive this message and we go out and all of us make a difference in this nation because this is where Satan is trying to draw this nation. And it's, uh, I believe we're in an awakening. It's not gonna happen, but it's gonna be turned around because of people just like you going out and speaking the truth. So let's welcome back uh, Pastor Rick as he comes and ministers to us. I heard when I was studying for um, uh, creation versus evolution that Stalin was a um, divinity student and that he actually got exposed to Darwin and when he read Darwin, he said that was the key to turning Russia was that they had to take every person and get them to embrace evolution that's because right. if they believed in God, they could not be a good that's communist. Correct. That's correct. So that's correct. I'll that's awesome. Am I on? I'll tell you something else. You know, history is important. 
You know, we know that when you don't know history, you're bound to repeat it. Well, everything that's happened in America has happened before, happened in the Soviet Union. For example, when communism came to power, which was Marxism, socialism, you know what the first thing they did? They began to tear down the statues. I could take you to empty pedestals all over Russia where they took down the statues because it was no longer considered right. Number two, Lenin's wife, whose name was Krupskaya, she was a lesbian. She had an American female lover. The two of them lived in the same room with Lenin. I just did a TV program in the room where the three of them lived together. That must have been very interesting. But Krupskaya was put in charge of Soviet education. And she said, we will never make this a communist state unless we get the minds of the children. And they began to change all the language. Terms which once meant one thing, they canceled. It was the original cancel culture. And they had what was called thought police. And if you did not conform to the thought police, you would be prosecuted. It's all the same thing. It's the same thing. But go back to 1 Peter chapter 4. By the way, did you enjoy that first session? Did you learn something? All right. Father, we thank you. We ask you to help us as we continue. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's review verse 1 again. Now the Spirit speaks expressly. By the way, the word now in Greek is the little conjunction day. It means now emphatically, emphatically, categorically. It's really strong. The Spirit speaks expressly, again, the word retus, unmistakably, indisputably, categorically, emphatically. So this means this is going to happen whether we like it or not. It's going to happen at the end of the age. And the Holy Spirit here is not scaring us. He is preparing us so we will be fit to serve God in a last day's generation. We're called for this. And by the way, if we're in the last days, we were appointed to it, we are anointed for it, and we can do it. And our job really is to rescue the perishing and care for the dying. We're living in an age when people need to be rescued by those who know the truth. And I'll tell you something else very interesting. The Apostle Paul says the God of this world in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 has blinded the minds of unbelievers. That word blinded, is the Greek word tifluo. It doesn't just describe people that have been blinded. It actually describes people whose eyes have been gouged out. They don't have eyes to see. And that is why often when you share truth with people, they don't seem to see what you're saying. They don't have eyes to see it. But it is the declaration of truth that creates eyes in people's heads so they can see. And if you don't tell them the truth, they will never have eyes to see. And our job is to tell the truth, and the Holy Spirit then begins to create eyes so they can hear the truth. But when you come to 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, now emphatically, categorically, unmistakably, indisputably, the Spirit speaks expressly that husteros, when there's not much time left over, a notable group of people, and I've pointed out, that in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 2, it says many will go in this direction. The word poloi, it really means multitudes, shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines in demons. And notice verse 2, I rarely comment on this, but it says speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience, what? Seared with a hot iron. And here we find reprobate people inside the church. Christians can be reprobate. Let me give you another example of the word reprobate. I have on my finger a callus. This callus was formed when I was at school just learning to write because I pressed so hard with my number one and number three pencil when I was writing my big chieftain tablet when I was a child. How do you remember those days? And my teacher would say, Ricky, stop pressing so hard. I pressed so hard. I formed a callus. That callus has been with me all my life. And when I was a young boy, I really used my callus 
because I would stick pins through my finger and I couldn't feel anything. And I could attract a crowd around me. And I would show them how I could just stick pins through my finger with no pain whatsoever. But why didn't I feel it? Because I was calloused. I was calloused. And when you subject yourself to wrong thinking over and over and over and over, it desensitizes you. That's what's happening to our children. That's what's happening if you watch television every night. You're being desensitized little by little by little by little. And by the way, now the devil is becoming really blatant with what he's doing. If you notice, transgender people are being put in very public positions right in your face. So you become numb to it and you become used to it and it doesn't bother you like it did initially. It's the process of numbing or desensitizing. And your conscience becomes seared with a hot iron. I'm sure that you know believers who one time believed one thing very firmly. You know that they are children of God. But now, by listening to and listening to and listening to and listening to wrong information, they're beginning to move in a wrong direction. And they're just numb to the reality of what they're doing. They're becoming seared. Or they're becoming numbed. In fact, hold your finger here and let's go over to 2 Peter chapter 2 and I'll give you an illustration of this from Scripture. 2 Peter chapter 2, the Bible talks about Lot. And when you come to 2 Peter chapter 2, it's talking about God dealing with the world, God dealing with angels. And when you come to verse 6, it says that God dealt with the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes. Well, when you read this in the Greek text, turning the cities into ashes is all one Greek word. And it describes, it was used by Dia Cassius, the great Roman historian, to describe the top of Mount Vesuvius when it erupted. After it erupted, the top of that mountain became so brittle that it just began to break and fall into the throat of the volcano until the top of the mountain completely disappeared. Well, that's what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah fell into the earth, and that is why today you can't find it. It is at the bottom of the Dead Sea, which is the lowest point on the face of the earth. That is how much God judged Sodom and Gomorrah. And turning the Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes condemned them. The word condemned describes a catastrophe with an overthrow, making them a what? An example. Oh, my, my, my. This word example, the Greek word hupodegma. It's one of those words that's only used one way, so it can only be interpreted one way. This word example was the very word used to describe an artist who before he made the big, big, big statue first, he made a small sculptor's model. He perfected it on a very small level. It was the prototype. And once he had refined the prototype or the model, then later he enlarged it to the real deal. So now Peter says, if you want to know what's coming in the future, just turn around and look at Sodom and Gomorrah because it was God's prototype. It was the sculptor's small-scale model of what will happen to the ungodly at the end of the age. And then when you go to verse 7, it says, And delivered just Lot, who was vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked, for that righteous man dwelling among them, in seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. And here we find the picture of a righteous man. Twice in these verses, he's called just, he's called righteous. In Greek, it is the word dikaios. It's a man that was righteous or was just in the mind of God. But now we find this man who walked in faith with his uncle Abraham. He was with Abraham when Abraham left Ur of the Chaldees. He was with Abraham when Abraham built the first altar. And in fact, he probably helped collect the stones to build the altar with his uncle Abraham. He walked every step of faith with Abraham. But then a day came when he was given a choice of where he would live. And the Bible tells us that he lifted up his eyes to the plains of Sodom and Gomorrah. Well, Sodom and Gomorrah were very similar to Ur of the Chaldees, which means even though he had taken those steps of faith with his uncle, he had never got the world out of his heart. Ur of the Chaldees was the lap of luxury. It was the richest, most luxurious city in the world. Next were the 
cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. These were very sophisticated, rich, rich cities. And when he was given an option, and think about his option. He had been walking with Abraham, traveling in a caravan, living a very uncomfortable life of faith. And when he got an option to have something a little more easy, he chose it. And this happens to many people who say, this life of faith has been hard. I've given it my best, but you know, I, I, I want to just let up and take an easier way. That's what Lot did. But Lot did not just barge right into Sodom and Gomorrah. If you read Genesis 18 and 19, it says he pinched, pitched his tent toward Sodom. He could sit under the flap of his tent and from under the flap of his tent, he could smell the smells carried from Sodom. He could see the lights in the distance of Sodom. And every day, Lot began to move his tent a little closer, a little closer, a little closer, until finally this righteous man ended up convincing himself that he could live in a very ungodly place and not be affected. And he ended up right in the middle of Sodom, not just in the middle of Sodom, but Acts chapter 19 tells us when the two angels came to Sodom to judge it, Lot was sitting in the gate of the city. That is so significant because only the city elders and elected, elected officials sat in the gate of the city, which means Lot had become so entwined in the lifestyle of Sodom that he was endorsed, probably even elected by them, for the men of Sodom to elect Lot, he had to be one of them. And he had enough spirituality left to recognize these were two angels. And he pleaded with the angels to come into his house and to stay all night. You know why? Because he knew that if they stayed in the streets all night, they would see what was happening in the streets and they would judge the city. He loved Sodom so much, he didn't want the angels to do what they had been sent to do and pleaded with them to stay in his house. But in Acts cha Genesis chapter 19, it says the men of Sodom discovered the two angels were there. They must have been very good looking angels because all the men of Sodom wanted them. And the Bible tells us they surrounded Lot's house, they banged on the door and Lot came out to them and what he said to them is very revealing. They said, bring these men out to us that we may know them or we may rape them. And Lot said to them, brethren. He spoke to all of those men and called them brethren. That shows to what degree he had sunk morally, even though the Bible calls him a just and a righteous man. He said, don't do this thing, which is so horrible, but instead I have two daughters which have not known man. Take them and do to them anything that you wish. Here is the example of a just man who became so reprobate in his thinking that he thought it was wrong to rape the angels, but it was okay to rape his daughters. And to also show you how far he had disintegrated in his own spiritual standing, when he finally realized judgment was coming, he spoke to his sons-in-laws. That's interesting. He had sons-in-laws, yet his daughters had never known men. Which appears the sexual dysfunction was in his own house. He had two girls who had sexually never known their own husbands. And when he began to say to his own sons, get up, get out of here. The Lord is going to judge this place. The Bible says he seemed to his sons as one that mocked this righteous man had never spoken gospel truth to his sons. And now when he began to speak truth to them in an urgent moment, they said, well, what are you, a preacher? We've never seen you like this before. And when the moment for destruction came, he wouldn't have even left if the angels hadn't grabbed hold of his hand. The Bible says, be merciful unto him. They dragged him, dragged his wife, dragged his daughters by the hand and pulled them out and they were delivered. And now that's what this means. And delivered just lot. The word delivered in verse seven, the Greek word rumai, which means to deliver just in the nick of time, when it was just on the brink of destruction, just Lot who was vexed with a filthy conversation of the wicked. The word vexed, the Greek word kataponeia, kata means down. The word paneo means to work to the point of exhaustion. When you compound the two words together, it means one that is so wearied by his environment that he succumbs to it, throws up the white flag and just says, hey, I surrender. This means he surrendered to his environment. To what extent he surrendered, we don't know. 
But the use of this word vex emphatically tells us this righteous man who once knew a walk of faith has now surrendered to the filthy conversation of the wicked, verse 8, for that righteous man dwelling among them. The word dwelling means who settled in, settled down, and lived comfortably among them in seeing and hearing. And the Greek text says, in seeing and seeing and seeing and seeing and hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing and constantly seeing and constantly hearing by seeing and hearing and seeing and hearing, he subjected his soul to that environment and vexed himself. He calloused himself to where he was living. This is why we need to be so careful about what we see and what we listen to because what you see and what you listen to affects your soul. It affects your soul. And this should concern you for every one of your children and every one of your children who are living on their smartphones and you don't know what they're watching. We have children whose souls are being vexed and we're not even aware that it's taking place. But let's go back over to 1 Timothy chapter 4. And we find this is going to happen to some in the church in the end of the age. They're going to become callous. Their conscience will be seared with a hot iron because of what they've looked at and what they've listened to. And by looking at and listening to the wrong information, it has led them off track. But what is the answer? Look at verse 6. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine whereunto thou hast attained, but refuse profane and old wives' fables, and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. Well, first of all, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 must have been very, very shocking to Timothy because he was a pastor in Ephesus, which was a pagan world. Most today don't understand what it was like living in the pagan world. But for example, if you went to the city of Ephesus, along all of the streets, I could take you there, I could give you a professional tour of Ephesus, I've written a whole book on it. Columns, beautiful, beautiful columns with covered porticos with terracotta roofs and beautiful mosaics. And in between all of the columns, statues of naked people. And by the way, the Greek world of that time was already worshiping the image of man. So man had become the apex of what it worshiped. And that's why they worship the naked form of the human body. And today when you see these statues, they look like they're just white marble in museums. But all of those white statues were originally colored. They looked like a real flesh. So when the gospel preachers, for example, first came to Ephesus, it was like they were walking through living pornography on every side. Everywhere they looked in paganism, it was everywhere. And one thing that most people don't know, the Bible tells us not to eat meat that is offered to idols. Do you know why you weren't supposed to meet, eat offered to idols? wasn't the meat. The Bible even says it wasn't the meat. Nothing wrong with meat. Demons don't possess meat. But the best meat had been offered in idolatry. So if you want to have the best meat, you have to go into the temples to buy the best meat. So if you want to buy the very best cut of meat, you go into the temples. And when you study 1 Corinthians chapter 9, he says, don't you do that. I don't want you to have fellowship with demons, the Greek word koinonia, which means interaction with demons, which means by being in the wrong place, you can be affected by a wrong spiritual influence. And people, because they wanted good meat, were going into the temples to buy it, walking out of the temples under a wrong spiritual influence that they picked up while they were there. But here... Here's what the pagans believed, and please forgive me for being graphic, but I just want you to understand the world that the church was born into. For example, in the worship of Aphrodite in the city of Corinth. Just above the city of Corinth on the top of the Acropolis was the great temple of Aphrodite, who was the goddess of the streetwalkers, the goddess of the prostitutes. 
And the reason that Corinth had been reestablished is because Julius Caesar really believed he was a descendant of Aphrodite. So he established the city of Corinth. He dedicated it to the goddess Aphrodite. And because it was dedicated to the goddess Aphrodite, the city was filled with prostitutes. It was prostitutes. It had a port on the west. It had a port on the east. And Corinth was the Las Vegas of the ancient world. People would come from the east, people would come from the west, and what they did in Corinth stayed in Corinth. And when they came to Corinth, they yielded themselves to every sexual pleasure that they wished. And the people believed, this is what they believed, not just of Aphrodite, that's just a good example. But the people believed that if your crops were going to be blessed, then you had to do something to make the gods bless your crops. If you wanted your business to be blessed, then you had to do something to cause the gods to bless your business. And here's what pagans believed. They believed that you were going to the temple, for example, right in front of the statue of Aphrodite, and you were to lay on the altar and have sex with one of the temple prostitutes. And because you did it in front of the goddess Aphrodite, it then would sexually stir Aphrodite so that Aphrodite then would become amorous and would have a sexual relationship with one of the other gods. And when the two of those gods got together and had sex, somehow it would release prosperity and increase to your crops. It would increase prosperity to your business. So as a pagan, if you wanted your vineyard to grow, if you wanted your business to be blessed, then you went to the temple to have sex with one of the temple prostitutes. And it was considered by the world at that time the highest honor for your young daughter to become a temple prostitute because she was so connected to the gods. That's how perverse the world was at that time. Now, that's the world Timothy was living in when the Holy Spirit said, in the latter times, it's going to get really bad. Do you see how context provides so much for us? Timothy must have wagged his head and said, wow, what's it going to be like in the end of the age if it's already like this now? But when you come to verse 6, he gives Timothy the answer for his age and also the answer for our age. And in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6, he says, if you put the brethren in remembrance of these things... Thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. But notice the very first of the verse, the King James Version says, if you put the brethren in remembrance. That is such a bad translation. It is the Greek word hupo tithemi. The preposition hupo means under. For example, if I crawled under this podium, the word hupo would describe me. It means to be underneath something. But the second part of the word is the word tithemi. The word tithemi is an architectural word, which means to lay, to place, or to set a foundation. So if you translate this verse really correctly, a better translation would be, if you come under the brethren, and if you put a foundation underneath them, this will make you a good minister of Jesus Christ, which means if we want to be good ministers of Jesus Christ, then we're going to spend our life crawling under other people's lives to give them the foundation that they never received from their parents, that they never received because of the age in which they live. Our call of God is to crawl under the saints and put a foundation underneath their life. And the form that is used here is continuous. It is perpetual, which means when you're called to ministry for the rest of your life, your job is to crawl under people, to support them, to put a foundation of the word of God underneath their life, to give them something to stand on. That's the answer for a wayward society. Give them a foundation. And then he says, if you do this, thou shalt be a what? Good minister of Jesus Christ. Everybody say minister. Well, in the New Testament, there are three words which are translated minister or servant. The first word is the word dolos. The word dolos is generally used all over the New Testament to describe anybody that is a child of God. For example, in James chapter 1, verse 1, James identifies himself as James the servant of God. That word servant, the Greek word dolos. It's the same word for a bond slave, anyone sold into slavery. It's the very lowest term for a slave in the Greek language. 
It depicts one that has been sold into slavery and one who now lives entirely to fulfill the desires, even the whims of his master, lock, stock, and barrel. His sole purpose for existence is to serve his master. And that word is used to describe Christians all over the New Testament, which means the moment we became the child of God, by position, we became sons, but in practice, we became servants. And our job now is to do the bidding of our master, whatever it is, lock, stock, and barrel. Our purpose is to serve him in anything he ever asks us to do. And that word is used to describe all believers. And a great usage of that word is in Romans chapter 6. So turn there. Romans chapter 6. This is so glorious. And in Romans chapter 6, the apostle Paul describes us as dolos, formerly being the servants of sin. Look at it. Verse 17. But thanks be to God that whereas you were the, what? Servants, the word dolos. Before Christ, you belonged to sin. You lived to fulfill the desires of sin. Everything in you lived for one purpose alone. You were controlled by sin. Sin was your master. But then in verse 18, it says, being then made free from sin, you've become the servants of righteousness, which means to the same extent sin once controlled you, now righteousness controls you. Lock, stock, and barrel, you belong to righteousness today. You're no longer the servant of sin. But that word is used to describe every believer. Every believer, we're all the servants of God, the word dolos. But then you come to the second word, which you find in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. So turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. And when you come to 1 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul's speaking to the Corinthians. And the Corinthians were very involved in preacher worship. So he's telling them how they ought to really think about preachers. And he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 1, Let a man so account us as the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Everybody say ministers. This is the word huperetas. The previous word was dolos. This is the word huperetas. They don't even sound the same. What does this word huperetas mean? This particular word ministers in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, the Greek word huperetas is the word for an under rower or a slave who was assigned to the bottom of shipping vessels. And when he was assigned to the bottom of the vessel, it was not a temporary assignment. It was his assignment for the rest of his life. And he was chained to a bench. And on every bench, listen to this, there were five slaves, five of them working together chained to that bench, working as a team, and a big aura was placed into their hands, and their motto was, row, row, row the boat, and 18 hours a day on average, they rowed and rowed and rowed and rowed the boat. And the reason they were chained to the bench is because from time to time, they would want to escape, but that chain guaranteed they would never leave the place of service. Above on the deck was the captain. And next to the captain was a man who had a drum who sat next to an opening in the top deck of the ship. That opening went all the way down to the bottom where the under rowers were working. And that man would take orders from the captain. And if the captain said, move the ship faster, the drummer would begin to beat a faster beating of the drum. And the under rowers would begin to row according to the movement of the drum. If the captain said, slow it down, he would beat slower. They would slow down. If he said, turn right, turn left, do this, do that, they all road according to the instructions they were receiving from the drummer who received his instructions from the captain of the ship. A major problem with these under rowers were the rats that lived in the bottom of the ships. And while they were rowing and rowing and rowing and rowing with one of their hands, they were slapping the rat off of them. And because they were chained, they couldn't even get away from the rats. So they were rowing with one hand, slapping a rat with the other hands. And a major problem were the passengers on deck who were just there for a free ride, constantly complaining. Is it not possible to move this ship any faster? Why are we not getting to our destination a little bit faster? 
And Paul uses this word in all of these nuances to describe ministers of the gospel. We are called under. Every word which describes a gospel, a gospel minister always positions them under the people putting the foundation. Here, we find a gospel minister in the bottom of the ship. We have been chained to the bench, which represents our perpetual commitment, which means ministry is not a temporary assignment. It is a calling, believe it or not, from which there is no escape. This is why Paul called himself the prisoner of the Lord. And notice that they were with four other Slaves, which is a picture of five-fold ministry, all working in unison together. A big roar had been placed in their hand, and they were listening to instructions from above as the captain of the ship, which in this case would be Jesus, is telling us how fast to move, how slow to move, where to go, where to turn. The under rowers, that's us, taking directions from above. And just like the under rowers of the ancient world, my friends, I want to tell you, there is a rap community in the church. <laughs> and they love to nuz nuzzle up right next to people that are giving their all, oh, just to create a havoc. And my friends, there will always be rats in the church, so just row with one hand and slap them off with the other hand and stay focused on what you've been called to do. And if it seems people in the ministry are in the church, are complaining that the church has not grown faster or the ministry has not reached its destination sooner, just remind them if they would get off the deck and get in the bottom and grab her, or we might get there a little faster. That is the word which Paul said to the Corinthians. If you want to know how to think about us, hey, here's who we are. So now you have the word dolos, a slave for life. Now you have the word huperetas. We are the under rowers of the church, which means we are that are in the church in leadership. We are the engines of the church. You may get tired of that, but the truth is if you don't row, the church is not going to move. Our responsibility is take directions and keep this thing moving. That is our assignment. But then you come to 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6, where we also have the word minister. Thou shalt be a good minister. And in this case, the word minister is a completely different word. It is the word diakonos. How many of you know the word diakonos? Do you hear another word? What word do you hear? The word deacon. Now, Andrew and I grew up as Southern Baptists. And as a Southern Baptist, the deacons ruled and ran the church. They were in charge. That is not what the word diakonos means. The word diakonos was used in two ways. Number one, it was used to describe slaves in a particular community whose job was to serve people with humanitarian aid. That's why they're called deacons in Acts chapter 6. When the first deacons distributed help to the widows. That is the role of a deacon. These were slaves for the community. In this case, these were the servants of the church. Secondly, the word diakonos was used to describe high-level servers in very, very wealthy homes. You would call these waiters or waitresses. And their job was not just to serve food. Please listen to this. All of this is in this word diakonos, the word ministers. They were also to taste the food before it was served. To make sure there was nothing in that food that was toxic that was going to hurt the people around the table. They took the brunt of the food if it was bad. They had to taste it first. They had to drink the drink first before they served it to make sure they were serving what was healthy and what was good. Number two. Not only did they serve food, they were trained how to serve. They carried themselves in a way that was professional and respectable. They learned how to speak to people. They learned how to carry themselves. And when they served their food, they served their food so regally that those who were being served around the table felt like they were nobility just because of the way they were being served. And that is the word which Timothy here uses to describe anybody that is in the ministry, which means when you are in the ministry, 
before you stand in the pulpit and serve something that seems exciting, you better partake of it first to make sure what you're teaching or what you're endorsing doesn't carry sickness in it. You taste it first. You drink it first before you serve it to your congregation. You make sure it is sound teaching. Number two. When you are a minister of the gospel, you have to learn how to deal with people. We need to be professional in the way that we deal with people. Denise and I were called to intervene in a situation in Russia where pastor was having troubles with his church. I came into that meeting. The room was filled with angry people, angry people. I was sitting there to be a help to the pastor. He started the meeting like this. Well, Brother Rick, you're in the room full of idiots. He said, everybody in this room is an idiot. That's how it started. No wonder they were angry people. He said, now I want to know what you think. And I said, well, I want to tell you, I think you're the idiot. I said, when you're in the ministry, if you talk to people like that, you're not going to have a ministry very long. Even if you don't like what they're doing, you don't talk to them like that. And when you're in the ministry, you have to learn how to deal with people. They're gathered around the table. And my friends, you need to remember, it is always an honor that anybody would ever come here, which you have to say. They could go somewhere else. And you need to deal with people like it is an honor that they're assembled at the table. And there's one more thing about the word diakonos. It also is a Greek compound. Notice all these compounds. The word dia, which is a preposition, which means on behalf of. That's the first part of the word. The second part of the word is konos. The word konos is the word for that which is common. It's also the word for the community. When you compound it together, the word deacon, the Greek word diakonos, here translated minister, describes one who has been given on behalf of the community, and now his life belongs to them. He is a lifelong servant of the community, which again confirms ministry is not a temporary assignment. It is giving your life to serve the church. We belong to Christ. He gave us on behalf of the church. All of that is in this word minister. So now when you come to this verse, Paul says, if you do these things, number one, hupotithemi, if you crawl under the saints, if you spend your life putting a foundation underneath them, this will make you a good minister of Jesus Christ. And I've given you three kinds of ministers, but this is the word diakonos. And notice this as a good minister of Jesus Christ. Everybody say of. of. The word of would be better translated, a good minister just like Jesus Christ. Well, what did Jesus do? He gave his life on behalf of the church. Jesus was never retracted from his calling. It was a perpetual, eternal calling. He was given on behalf of, and when no one else helped him, he crawled under the foundation of the world, gave his life, laid a foundation underneath it, and you could actually translate, this will make you a good minister just like Jesus Christ. And then Paul adds, nourished up of the words of faith and of good doctrine whereunto thou hast Attained, And here we find for you to be a good minister of Jesus Christ, you have to have two essential things in your spiritual diet. Nourished up, the Greek word intrepho, means to taste, chew, eat, swallow, digest all the nutrients into your system. And now Paul tells us there's two things we need to be regularly eating if we want to be a good minister and remain a good minister. He says words of faith. And of good doctrine. Well, hey, friends, we need faith teaching. We need faith teaching. But we need more than faith teaching. I know a lot of churches where there's great faith teaching. And the pastors can't get anybody to serve in the church. You know why? He can't get anybody to work in the nursery. Because the people have been taught faith. And they're all believing for somebody else to work in the nursery so they can stay in the auditorium. If all you have is faith teaching without good doctrine, it produces selfishness. And that's why you have to have both good doctrine, good doctrine, 
is the teaching that puts you in the bottom of the boat. When you have good doctrine, you understand what Jesus did for you. And by the way, don't belittle that word doctrine. Many people say, ah, it's just doctrine. Friends, you need doctrine. That word doctrine is a great word. That is your foundation. And when you really understand everything Jesus did for you, and the Bible teaches again and again that we are appointed for good works. We've been called to serve the church. We've been called to find our place. And good teaching is what puts people in the bottom of the boat to grab that oar. They're willing to serve because of the doctrine they've received. And they're so grateful for their salvation. Now, I've said that Andrew and I grew up as Southern Baptist. So did Denise. And in the Southern Baptist church, we had good doctrine. But we didn't have any faith. We didn't have any faith. I can never remember one person we ever prayed for to be healed. Did you ever hear anybody pray for to be healed? You did? Your dad was raised from the dead. Well, Andrew, let me tell you about my church (laughs) and Denise's church. We had Wednesday night prayer meeting, which wasn't much of a prayer meeting. And the pastor would call for people who had prayer requests. Somebody would raise their hand. They'd say, my uncle's dying with cancer. And the pastor would say, because we were so emphasized on sovereignty, we need to pray that he will have the grace of God to embrace that cancer and die in a way that glorifies God. And I remember as a teenager thinking, if I ever get sick, I'm never going to ask this church to pray for me. That's what we believed. We didn't have any faith, but we really had really good doctrine. Everybody served. We were so happy to serve. We understood it was our responsibility to serve, but you've got to have faith and good doctrine. I say that good doctrine puts you in the bottom of the boat, but faith is important because it enables you to understand that one day you're really going to reach your destination. You're not just going to row forever. Your faith enables you to believe we're really going somewhere by what we're doing. That's why you need to have a mixture of faith and good doctrine. And my friends, you have to have both of these. Then look at the next verse. But refuse, everybody say refuse. The word refuse means refuse, reject with absolute intentionality. Absolutely reject this. Refuse profane and old wives' tales and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. Well, the word profane is the Greek word bibelos. The word bibelos describes anything that is rotten, anything that stinks. And in fact, it is the word for manure, manure. And if you really want to translate it correctly, which nobody does because it seems so rude, a little translation would be reject manure. And he's talking about wrong teaching, wrong thinking. And in fact, he says, refuse profane old wives' tales. This word profane also describes something that you should never allow across the threshold into your house. It is profane. Keep it out of your house. That's a good word for us when today you can listen to every crazy thing on YouTube and people are letting all kinds of crazy spiritual nonsense into their house. Even Denise and I are very careful about who we allow to be broadcast into our house. There are certain preachers I will not listen to. They're not coming across the threshold into my house because in the view of God's word, it is spiritual manure. It's just manure. Now, I'm not the one that said that. The Holy Spirit said that in this verse. And then he calls it old wives' tales. The word tales, the Greek word muthos, it's the old Greek word for mythology. It's the equivalent of saying what they're teaching and what they are preaching is closer to mythology than it is to the truth. This is nothing but fantastical inventions that are just barely even representative of the word of God. Keep it out of your life. And then he says, exercise thyself unto godliness. The word exercise The Greek word gumnadzo, it's where you get the word for a gymnasium. Now, that word gumnadzo was quite an austere word because Greeks and Romans, when they would come to the gymnasium or to the palestra, the first thing they would do is strip naked. 
You were not allowed into the gymnasium if you had a stitch of clothing on. You had to strip completely. And before you would be allowed to come into the gymnasium to participate, first you had to submit to your trainer who would work you over. He would douse you with oil. He would call a masseuse who would rub you so hard until you'd nearly scream. You'd want to slap the man. He was not just rubbing you with oil. He was engaging your flesh, getting you ready for combat. And by the way, the oil was free to the athlete. All he had to do was show up. But that oil was really expensive to the trainer. Exercise thyself unto godliness. Here we find another powerful Greek word study. That when we do the work of God and when we come into the church, we need to strip of everything so we can do what is in front of us. We need to strip of laziness. We need to strip of every excuse. You're not going to play this game and win unless you're willing to strip of a lot of stuff. And if you're not willing to submit to authority, you'll never win this game. You've got to be submitted to authority. You've got to let authority work you over. And if you will submit to spiritual authority, you'll get a dose of oil, which is the Holy Ghost. And by the way, that oil may be free to you, but it is not free to the one that is serving you. It costs them something to bring you the oil, which they're freely applying to you. That if you're willing to submit, you'll receive a dose of oil. Head to toe, so slippery that even if the enemy grabs you, he'll never be able to hold on to you. But if we want to be successful in these times and confront the error of our age, then we need to crawl under the saints and give our life to put a foundation underneath them. Thank you for listening to me today. Praise God. You're dismissed. That's awesome. Go out and be a blessing to someone. Eternal spark, I call you healer. You can mend any broken heart, I call you faithful father. Finish everything you start, my soul was made to respond.